Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm Tosca Lee, and I'm one of the Rogue Women Writers. We are a group of 10 thriller writers whose backgrounds range from intelligence officer to journalism to crime scene analyst to special investigators, hostage negotiators, psychotherapists, to inter international consultants, to White House strategists. A quick orientation. There's a chat room on the side of the screen. So if you click the chat icon, you can put your questions there. Uh, participants and our special guests, please feel free to go ahead and introduce yourself with a quick comment in the chat bar. For those of you joining us on Facebook Live, please be sure to say hello and leave a comment if you have anything you'd like to, to say to the authors, and especially if you have a question that you'd like to ask, and we will do our best to try to accommodate them all. We are in for a super treat tonight. Um, the authors will be reading from their newest work, sharing a few, sharing a few of their favorite treats, and maybe even a few behind the scenes secrets. All of the books discussed here tonight should be available to buy or pre-order through your local bookstore. So please be sure to grab or order a copy, support your local booksellers, and also check out our guest's previous work, which is a lot of books to choose from. Let's all use the hashtags, hashtag Rogue Reads and hashtag Rogue Women Writers as we post about our experiences with these authors and their works tonight. Also, you can go rogue with us once a month. You can receive news and more before anyone else. Just sign up for our free monthly newsletter, and you can do that on our website. We have a quindruple, quintuple, quin. We have five books to give away tonight. We've got The Watchmaker's Hand by Jeffrey Deaver, Unnatural Death by Patricia Cornwell, The Spy Coast by Tess Gerritsen, Lost Hours by Paige Shelton, and Fall by Tracy Clark. And winners are chosen from our registered attendees and will be notified a few days after our event via email. So keep your eyes on your inboxes. So as I said, my name is Tosca Lee. I'm an author of 12 novels, most recently The Long March Home, and I'm coming to you tonight from the Nebraska countryside, and I'm thrilled to be emceeing this event. So I'm now going to introduce our five authors, and as I do, please feel free to post your questions at any time, and we will get to as many as we can. So let's get to it. First up, because she uh, will need to leave us a little bit earlier than the others. We're going to start with Patricia Cornwell, who has sold over 100 million books and authored 29 New York Times bestsellers. Her first novel, Postmortem, was the first bona fide forensic thriller. It paved the way for an explosion of entertainment featuring all things forensic across film, television, and literature. Today, Patricia's novels and iconic characters are known around the world. In addition to the Scarpetta series, she's also written the definitive account of Jack the Ripper's identity. While writing Quantum, she spent two years researching space, technology, and robotics at NASA's Langley Research Center and studied cutting-edge law enforcement and security techniques with the Secret Service, the U.S. Air Force, NASA Protective Services, Scotland Yard, and Interpol. Her new book releases November 28th, and it is A, a Natural Death, the most chilling cases of Scarpetta's career. And this is Patricia's 27th Scarpetta novel. So Patricia, welcome, and please tell us about A Natural Death. Well, thank you, and it's it's so much, it's so wonderful to be here, especially in such an auspicious crowd, such a wonderful audience, and the, all these the humongous authors that I'm so humbled to be with. Um, a Natural Death, opens with Scarpetta's on her way to a very strange crime scene. Two people were out camping in the middle of an uninhabited forest um, that hasn't, no one's been around much for about 200 years because it's a gold mines that were shut down way before the Civil War. And why people are out there is a mystery. And these two, these, this husband and wife have been savagely murdered. One body is in a mine shaft, the other is floating in a polluted lake. And Scarpetta is headed that way. But what throws the biggest munch, monkey wrench into this is that at the scene inside this old gold mine, they find this footprint. And I'm talking a very big footprint. And so the big question is, I mean, is Bigfoot got something to do with this? Is this, a, and, and by the way, it wouldn't be a homicide, then it would be an accident. And it's all these questions that are raised. And of course, 
what you think is going on is not going to be what's going on, but it is a, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a big adventure. I will tell you right now, Bigfoot did not do it. I will not have him blamed for something where people go out looking for him in the woods, but I think he may have seen who did it. And I think you're, it's a, it's a fun adventure. All right. We're so excited for this book and Patricia, would you be willing to read to us a page or two from I, a natural I, death? Yes. I hope I don't run into any big words. You know, I write these words that I, I can't pronounce, but I'll, I'll give it a try. So this is the very beginning of it. I step off the elevator on the morgue level, the air foul beneath the cloying patina of deodorizer. A stuttering fluorescent light is enough to cause vertigo, the white tile floor blood dripped and dirty. Cinder block walls are scuffed and smudged, the red biohazard trash cans overflowing. It's a few minutes past 9 a.m., November 1st, and yesterday was the deadliest Halloween on record in Northern Virginia. People were busy killing themselves and others, the weather dangerously stormy. <clears throat> I left my Alexandria office late and was back before daylight. We're far from caught up, and I'd be inside the autopsy suite right now if I hadn't been summoned to a scene that promises to be a nightmare. Two campers have been killed near an abandoned gold mine 60 miles southwest of here. The primitive wilderness of Buckingham Run isn't a place people hike or visit, and I've looked up information about it, getting a better idea what to expect. Virginia's Office of the Chief Medical Examiner hasn't had a case from there in some 80-some 80, 80 years of history. That doesn't mean there haven't been fatalities nobody knows about. Buckingham Run isn't mapped or accessible by motorized ground transportation, and I wouldn't dare try to try it on foot. Thousands of acres are riddled with mine shafts and tunnels, among other life-threatening hazards that includes contaminations by poisons. There's no telling what might live in vast forest land that's been relatively untouched by humans since before the Civil War. It goes without saying there are large animals, perhaps some that people wouldn't imagine, and I'm not talking about only bears. Images flash nonstop from videos that Pete Marino has been sending since he arrived at the scene. The nude female body impaled by hiking poles floating in a lake reflecting fall colors. The campsite scattered near the entrance of the abandoned gold mine, danger and go away barely legible on centuries old warning signs. Wow, thank you so much for giving us a sneak peek I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next authors and we're gonna to hope to get back to you, Patricia, before you need to jump. So, because I have questions to ask. So, all right. Next up, we have Jeffrey Deaver. Jeffrey Deaver is the number one international bestselling author of more than 40 novels and his books have appeared on bestseller lists around the world. His books are sold in 150 countries and translated into 25 languages. He has served two terms as president of Mystery Writers of, of America and was recently named a Grand Master of Mystery Writers of, of America, whose ranks include Agatha Christie, Ellery Queen, Mary Higgins Clark, and Walter Mosley. Um, Deaver has been honored with the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Bausher Khan World Mystery Convention, the Strand Magazine's Lifetime Achievement Award, and the Raymond Chandler Lifetime Achievement Award in Italy. His book, A Maiden's Grave, was made into an HBO movie starring James Garner and Marley Matlin, and his novel, The Bone Collector, was a feature release from Universal Pictures starring Denzel Washington and Angelina Jolie, and I remember seeing it in the theater. <laughs> Lifetime aired an adaptation of his The Devil's Teardrop, and NBC Television recently aired the nine-episode primetime series Lincoln Rhyme Hunt for the Bone Collector. All right, Jeffrey's new book is The Watchmaker's Hand coming out. November 28th. This is his 16th Lincoln Rhyme novel. So Jeffrey, please tell us about The Watchmaker's Hand. Well, thank you, Tosca, and, and thank you, uh, everyone, attendees and my fellow authors. Um, uh, yes, this is a Lincoln Rhyme novel, and uh, every hero needs a nemesis. You know, Holmes had Moriarty, James Bond has, well, too many to count. He's got a lot of nemesis, whatever the plural is. And um, Lincoln Rhyme has one too, and he's the watchmaker. And I, I love my villains. You know, I think many of my authors, uh, my co-authors in the audience will agree, our heroes we love, but the, the, the villains are almost more fun to create because, you know, we try to make them a little smarter, uh, have a little more ingenuity. Uh, certainly they are amoral and are not beholden to the laws and regulations like our heroes must be. Anyway, um, Lincoln and uh, the watchmaker uh, collide off and on in my series 
And this is the final showdown at the OK Corral. Um, the Watchmaker's Hand is typical of my books. It takes place over only about a day and a half. Uh, there are many re internal reversals. Uh, there's a big surprise ending. After that, there's a big surprise ending. Following that, there's a big surprise ending. Because as you, if anybody's read my books, you know I'm not satisfied with just one ending. I like multiple endings. Why is that? Because readers are so smart. It's quite irritating. Uh, they can usually figure out one surprise ending, maybe even two, but I try to get them with that third zinger. All right, Jeffrey, thank you so much. Would you read a little bit to us? Sure, I'd be delighted to, thank you. Thank I'm gonna to have to set the stage for this a little bit. Uh, the Watchmaker, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the nemesis of Lincoln Rhyme, um, he has um, planted a, a, a device. It's not actually a bomb. It's kind of an acid fume device. We can call it an improvised explosive device in Lincoln Rhyme's townhouse uh, on Central Park West. And the watchmaker is in the, uh, the, the bushes of Central Park across the street, staring up into the, um, um, the window, and he's about to push the button. And we pick up here. As with so many human constructs interpreting in different nature, time knows no natural intervals. We've decided on hours and minutes and seconds. So while it could be said that Lincoln Rhyme would die in five minutes, that is at 10.15 p.m. on Tuesday, May 14th, the most accurate way to put that message is the truism. He lived the length of time from his birth to his death. Requisit in pacem, Lincoln. Hale, uh, the watchmaker's real name, was crouching in the bushes outside the townhouse. He pulled out his phone and read the message he received a few minutes earlier. It was from the pilot reporting that the plane was at Teterboro, the private airport in New Jersey, ready to go to take him to a safe house in a different country. The drive there would take only 40 minutes. Pushing the key that would, send, uh, that would end Rhyme's life would be the final cog of his mission here in New York tonight. But this was the chess move that would have to wait just a moment. There was a penultimate mission, next to last. More Latin words came to mind in Hale's uh, senses. Paena ultimato. Clocks are not moral or amoral. They count second by second, ticking out the moments of joy and sorrow and pain and pleasure and cruelty. But they remain utterly indifferent to what occurs at any particular tick. And so it was with no regret whatsoever, or joy for that matter, that Hale now pushed one combination of keys that would detonate the charge on the warehouse bomb that was right next to patrolman Ron Pulaski. It would keep him alive for only a few minutes until the acid fumes destroyed his life and ended it. Lincoln Rhyme himself would die thinking that he had saved the life of the young man, which Hale had lied about. That would have brought him some peace. But Hale could not afford another grain of sand in the work of his life, and so Pulaski had to die. He was heir to rhyme skill and had the strength of heart that would motivate him to do whatever it took to find Hale and either bring him back to New York or the realistic aspect that he believed would happen, shoot him in the head when he found him. No, Pulaski had to go. And what of Amelia Sachs? She was less of a threat. Justice was within her like a diamond vein, but revenge was not. She wouldn't choose to forgo her job of stopping evil in the city for the lengthy and possibly futile mission of pursuing her husband's killer. Hale had been dramatic with Rhyme in describing the effects of the gas on Ron Pulaski, but there was no time release mechanism in the device. All of the acid in the jar would flood the room, painful, yes, but Pulaski was now dead. And now for the piece de resistance, the last task of this evening. Hale looked around him and seeing no threats, he looked down and solemnly tapped the keys on the tablet that sent the signal to a similar device, the one that he'd hidden in Lincoln Rhymes townhouse. There was a brief flash of light and, well, I'm a suspense writer. I kind of, oh, you know, I'm genetically programmed to leave you in suspense. So, uh, all right, done, so shameless, done, done. Uh, shameless self promotion. So, if you want to find out whether Lincoln Rhyme lives or dies, um, you got to buy the book. What can I say? <laughs> That's fabulous. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. I, and I can't wait to ask you some questions um, on our second round. So, I'm going to move on to Tess now. 
<laughs> Internationally best-selling author Tess Gerritsen took an unusual route to a writing career. A graduate of Stanford University, Tess went on to medical school at the University of California in San Francisco, where she was awarded her MD. While on maternity leave from her work as a physician, she began to write fiction, and in 1987, her first novel, Call After Midnight, was published. It was just the first of 31 suspense novels that she's written over a 36-year writing career. Among her titles are Gravity, The Surgeon, Vanish, Listen to Me, and her new thriller, The Spy Coast, which has just been optioned by Amazon Studios for a television series. Her books have been translated into 40 languages, and more than 40 million copies have been sold around the world. Her series of novels featuring a homicide detective Jane Rizzoli and medical examiner Mara Isles inspired the hit TNT television series Rizzoli and Isles, starring Angie Harmon and Sasha Alexander. Tessa's The Spy Coast released November 1st and already has over 21,000 rave reviews. So this is the start of a new series called The Martini Club. Tess, tell us all about it. Well, I'll tell you the origin story of But actually, this, this book has been uh, incubating for about 30 years. Uh, ever since I moved to Maine 33 years ago, um, I moved to a very small town on the coast. My husband is a doctor, and he opened up a medical practice. And he would take occupational histories of these new patients. And he kept hearing this answer. I used to work for the government and I can't talk about it. And mm -hmm. after about the third time, he said, he thought, well, who are these people? And it was a real estate agent who said, they're all retired CIA. It turned out we, I had on my short street, two retired spies. Um, the, my son's best friend, his parents were married spies during the Vietnam era. And I just kept thinking, all these people I know, you know, have come here, they've got silver hair, they must have had interesting jobs. What is retirement like for them? Um, and so eventually it, it, uh, it took, as I said, a couple of decades. And then I heard the voice of Maggie Bird, my heroine, who just said, I'm not the woman I used to be. And I wanted to find out who she used to be. And that's, that's how the story came. It was like, Maggie, tell me your story. So um, she is, uh, she's now a chicken farmer. She's in her 60s. Uh, she left the agency after a very, very tragic uh, last operation. And uh, she's trying to forget the whole thing. So she's there with her fellow CIA retirees. They have cocktail parties. They have they have their monthly book group. You know, they get together, they gossip, they drink martinis. Um, and then a dead body shows up on Maggie's driveway. And she realizes it's a calling card from her past. She has to go back into the past to take care of something that went wrong before. Um, and she she headbutts with the local cop, who is a, a woman, a young woman, um, a solid Mainer who's been there for you know generations, her family. So it's like there's a conflict between the generations and there's a conflict between the locals and these exotic people from away who keep um, staying one step ahead of the cops and the cops can't figure it out. So wow. that's basically what it's about. Wow, thank you so much. Well, will you give us a, a sneak peek and read a little bit to us, Tess? Yeah, um, I'll read the scene where she first meets uh, the cop, Joe Thibodeau, Joanna Thibodeau. Um, she has been... <laughs> at a book group meeting with martinis. And when she's called by her neighbor that the cops are in her driveway and she doesn't know what's going on. Um, and uh, I'll start here. When I turn onto my private road, I see blue lights flashing through the trees, two police cruisers. Luther didn't exaggerate. It would take something serious to bring both, both of Purity's patrol cars to my house. I pull up behind one of the cruisers and step out into the strobe-like flashes of rack lights. At once, my attention is drawn to the reason why the police are here. There's a body lying in my driveway. The glare of the cruiser lights illuminates the woman's face, a face I recognize. Bianca lies flat on her back, her face looking up at the sky, her arms splayed out as though crucified. She wears the same clothes she wore this afternoon in my kitchen. Slim black pants, a form-fitting blue jacket, lace-up boots. Punched into her forehead are two bullet holes. Double tap. Three uniformed cops stand staring at me, two men and a woman. They're all young and far more accustomed to handing out traffic tickets or assisting lost tourists. Murder is not supposed to happen in our village of purity. And in the rare occasion when it does, the police usually know whom to arrest, the husband, the boyfriend. This situation has rattled them and they're looking at me as if I have all the answers. Do you live here, ma'am? The female cop asks. She's a sturdy blonde with her hair tied back in a no-nonsense ponytail. 
Despite her youth, she has an air of authority and she's obviously the senior officer, authoritative, but still polite enough to call me ma'am in the respectful tone one uses for a grandmother. Yes, I'm Maggie Bird, I own this farm and your name is? Joe Thibodeau, Purity PD. As you can see, there's a dead woman in my driveway. She pauses, taken aback by my blunt assessment. Perhaps she was expecting more drama from me, a scream, a gasp, something more than what I'm providing. But drama is not in my nature. Instead, I calmly assess the situation. I look at Bianca's hands, noting that both hands are bruised and black, her fingers bent and twisted at grotesque angles. Where have you been tonight, ma'am? Thibodeau asks. I refocus on the cop. I was having dinner with friends in town and my neighbor called. He said there were police cars in my driveway, so I came right home. I looked down at the body again. Who found her? Thibodeau frowns. I'm not behaving like the shocked grandmother she assumed I'd be. A FedEx driver, she says. He was here to drop off a package, his last delivery of the day. I glance at my porch, but there's no package there. I've been waiting for new heating lamps for the batch of chicks I ordered for the spring, and now it seems my delivery has been inconveniently delayed. Do you know who the woman is, ma'am? The cop asks. Ma'am again. It's starting to annoy me. She told me her name is Bianca. So you know her? Not really. Do you know her last name? She never gave me one. I met her for the first time this afternoon when she dropped by my house. Why was she visiting? The truth is too complicated for a small town cop to digest. She came to buy eggs, I say. That's the one and only time I spoke to her. There is a silence. Perhaps I could have come up with a better answer, but a martini and a few glasses of wine had dulled my edge. Any explanation closer to the truth would only invite more questions. I quickly ask one of my own, how did the body get here? No answer. I look down at multiple tire tracks left by my pickup truck, by the FedEx truck, and by the two police cruisers, a confusing jumble of crisscrossing tread marks. Did you find any vehicle nearby, I ask? No, ma'am. I bend down for a closer look at the body and she snaps, back away. We need to leave her exactly as she is for the state police. I obey her and take a step back, but I've already seen enough. The evidence is clear from the smashed hands, the dislocated fingers. Before she was dispatched with two bullets, Bianca was tortured. For information, as a statement? And why did the killer choose to dump the body in my driveway? If he is sending me a message, I don't know what it means. Dun, dun, dun. All it right. Dun, dun. Thank you so much, Tess. Okay. All right. I've got questions, but I'm going to go on and we're going to circle back. So thank you for that. Tracy Clark. Where's Tracy? Oh, I see her. Okay. Tracy is a native Chicagoan, is the author of the acclaimed, d d d oh gosh, <laughs> acclaimed detective Harriet Foster in Cass Rain's Chicago mystery series, a multi-nominated Anthony Lefty, Edgar McCavity, and Sh Seamus Award finalist. Tracy is also the 2020 and 2022 winner of the G.P. Putnam's Sons Sue Grafton Memorial Award. Boy, that was a tongue twister. Yeah. <laughs> Tracy knew from a young age that she wanted to write and is today a proud member of Sisters in Crime and Mystery Writers of America. A lifelong Southsider, she roots for every Chicago team with equal enthusiasm and considers a rainy Sunday with ginger snap cookies and a good black and white movie her perfect day. Tracy's new novel, Fall, the second in her Harriet Foster series, releases on December 5th. Tracy, welcome and tell us about Fall. Thanks for having me. Um, well, Fall is uh, book two in my Harriet Foster series. And in this one, Harriet and her dedicated team of homicide detectives are looking for the killer of uh, local politicians. They're the killing off aldermen. Um, now, when I mention that uh, for people who live outside of Chicago, I get sort of light, uh, polite uh, you know, applause or something. When I mention that to Chicagoans, I get raves. I mean, because we all got an alderman story. Uh, there are 2 million people in Chicago uh, that's a quite a, quite, a, quite a long suspect list for Harriet and her team. But the, the list that I sort of have in the book here is very specific. The killer is killing for a very specific reason and very specific alderman. So uh, it's a police procedural. Uh, it's a little creepy. I kind of like creepy now. And so uh, Harriet and her team are out there looking for this killer who is depositing, dispatching these aldermen and depositing 
30 dimes on their bodies, uh, the betrayer's payment, 30 pieces of silver. So it's an interesting case for her and her team. And of course she has, and on top of all of that, I've given her trauma that she's got to deal with. And uh, so that's where we are with, uh, with fall. All right, thank you so much. And Tracy, will you give us a sneak peek and read a little bit to us? And it, can your microphone come a little closer? Um, yeah, thank you, perfect. All right, uh, yeah, this is, a, we're starting with Harriet and her trauma, where Harriet be beyond the badge uh, before we get started with the killing. Detective Harriet Foster stared at her son's killer. She told herself that she needed to see if he changed in the four years since she'd seen him last, but that wasn't it. The test was for herself. Could she look at him and despise him less? Could she be in the same room again with Terrell Willem and not feel rage and contempt and an ungodly impulse to forfeit everything she was to end him? Willem was here for a resentencing hearing. She was here to give another impact statement. Willem couldn't have appeared more disinterested as he sat sullenly in his tan prison two-piece, his paunchy body fueled by cheap prison carbs, squeezed into the county-issued uniform, his washed-out V-neck top revealing a dingy white t-shirt beneath. Foster stood at the front of the courtroom, 211, at the Cook County Courthouse, her hands resting on the lectern, but Willem wouldn't look at her. Slumped at the hearing table, dull eyes focused on his feet, he was here in body only. His lawyer, a young public defender, outwardly nervous, sat beside him fiddling with file papers, her bright green eyes, pixie cut, and rosy cheeks strangely jarring in a place like this. Willem was now 22 and had spent the last five years in prison for murdering her son, Reg. But the look on the young man's dark face, the sneer, the vacantness of expression, told her that five years could have been 50 for all the difference they had made. No change. Terrell Willem was the same. Prison, free, here, there. He would always be this and only this. She might have been able to bring herself to lament the loss of his potential were it not for the fact that this waste had cost her the life of her 14-year-old son, her only child. But she was angry at more than Willem. Willem didn't amount to nothing on his own. Cognitively disadvantaged, slow, he'd been failed by a lumbering, inefficient school system and by a mother who had bore him at age 15 and hadn't a clue how to parent. Willem could barely read, had never held a job. He robbed and sold drugs and whatever else he needed to do to feed himself. His arms and neck were covered in violent tattoos that glorified death and killing and the gang to which he had sold his soul. Detached from civility, devoid of remorse, Willem was a hard and nasty chaos machine with no conscience. Harry had memorized his arrest record. She had learned all she could about Willem. Know thy enemy, keep him close. She knew him by the sour twist of his thick, dry lips, saw him in the false bravado that had had him leaning back in his chair, his long legs spread wide under the table, as though nothing worried him as if he had made, had no stake in what was being said or by whom. He was a child in a man's body, a child who hadn't been taught, who'd been allowed to grow as a destructive weed might and live like a feral dog that lurched undeterred from impulse to impulse. Willem had wanted Reg's bike, so he took it, but that hadn't been enough. He had to take Reg too. Oh my God, I lost it. Sorry about that. Uh, Harry stood with her back straight, her eyes on the killer at the table. She'd worn a black suit, her badge clipped to the belt at her waist, but hidden. Her gun, too. Both were tools of her trade, tools that defined her, marked her, steadied her hand. Resentencing. That's what they were here for. Because Willem had been just 17 at the time of her son's murder, a lawyer, not pixie cut had successfully argued that he deserved a break on his sentence of 99 years and a day, no parole. Willem's side was trying to whittle his punishment down to 75 years with parole on the table. Foster was here to stand for Reg. Willem was damaged goods, lost half a lifetime ago to abuse, neglect, and depravity, and she wanted him to serve every minute of those 99 years, even the day tacked on behind it. She wanted Willem to die in prison. On bad days, and there were many, she dreamed of being there when he did. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Yep. We're gonna be coming back to you. 
But first, we're going to move on to Paige Shelton. Hello, Paige. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Paige Shelton knew she wanted to be a writer from the age of seven. Today, she is the New York Times bestselling author of The Farmer's Market, Country Cooking School, Dangerous Type, and Scottish Bookshop Mysteries. She had a nomadic childhood as her father's job as a football coach, something we know about here in Nebraska, or we used to, um, took her family to seven different towns before she was even 12 years old. She even lived in a haunted house during a year in Portales, am I saying that right? New Mexico. After studying journalism at Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, next door, she moved to Salt Lake City. She thought she'd only stay a couple years, but instead she fell in love with the mountains and a great guy who became her husband. And after many decades in Utah, she and her family moved to Arizona. Paige's new novel, Lost Hours, releases December 5th, and it is number five in her Alaska Wild series. Welcome, Paige, and tell us about Lost Hours. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate being a part of this. If if you all could see my bookshelves, you'd know kind of how surreal it is that I'm here with a group of people who actually made me want to be a writer, not back when I was seven, but a little bit older. So thank you so very much. And thanks to all the readers. Um, and I see somebody's parents met at Drake University. Go Drake, go, go Bulldogs. And as well, one of my dad's mm -hmm. team played Nebraska back in the, the back in the heyday and Nebraska won. I was in the middle of the stadium and it was a bunch of a sea of red, exactly like it's supposed to be. And Nebraska won like 70 something to three. <laughs> so I've experienced all of that. It was a good time though, still nonetheless. So um, Lost Hours is again, as you said, the fifth book in the Alaska Wild series. The overarching story of the series is that Beth Rivers, who is a thriller writer, was kidnapped down in St. Louis. She spent three days in a van, in her kidnapper's van. She escaped the van. And then after some time in the hospital where, where she received brain surgery, she ran away to Alaska and tell her kidnapper could be found and locked away. She's hiding. She's afraid. She struggles. She has a lot of issues. All right. Well, we would love to hear a sneak. We would love to hear a sneak peek. <laughs> if you don't mind reading a little bit to us, Paige. I would love to. Thank you. Um, this is an abridged first part of the book. Um, I'm going to jump in a few pages from the beginning, but in a nutshell, in those first pages, you learn that Beth is finally taking a tour boat out to see the glaciers. Her man friend, Tex, is with her. With a jolt, as I was surveying an island overflowing with birds, the ship took a sharp right veer. I gasped and grabbed the railing in reflex. Before I could understand what had caused the change in trajectory, the noise of a siren filled the air. What in the world? I looked around but couldn't spot any immediate danger. It didn't appear that we were about to run into anything or be run aground. I had no sense that we would be sinking. I certainly hope not. I scanned the nearby land masses, the other visible islands, but didn't immediately spot anything that might be cause for trouble. Beth, you okay? Tex raised his voice above the siren's din. I'm okay. What's going on, though? Not sure. Mercifully, the siren ceased, just as we and probably everyone else who'd come out to the deck saw what must have garnered the attention. Standing on the shore of an island was a woman. She was distraught, maybe in her 30s, her body language begging for help. She was also covered in blood. Damn, I heard Tex utter. I'm going to see if there's anything I can do to help. Stay aboard the boat, Beth. You don't know these waters. Just stay here. Don't leave. I nodded as he hurried away. He'd been trained and had been part of many local search and rescue operations. I wouldn't leave the boat, but I did make my way with everyone else who'd come out to the deck to the bow. A tinny voice came from a speaker that had been secured to a pole with a rope. This is your captain, Horace Morehouse speaking. As you might have noticed, we need to make an assist here. Folks, this happens. It appears that our rescue is standing upright, so we just need to get her aboard and make sure she's taken care of. Please remain calm and stay on the main deck as we get to her. Thank you. No one appeared panicked, but concern rumbled through the growing group of onlookers. The blood-covered woman was a terrifying sight to behold, but the captain was correct. She was upright, which was definitely good news. I squinted toward the shore as we approached, wondering if I knew her or had seen her around, but it was more likely that she was a tourist who'd found herself in some trouble. She didn't seem to be badly hurt. In fact, despite all the blood, I couldn't spot any injuries. 
Oh no, I said quietly, what if she wasn't the injured one? What if the blood came from someone else? Someone she hurt? My heart rate picked up as other scenarios played through my mind. What if this was a trick? What if she was luring someone to shore to hurt them? Oh, for goodness sake, stop it. I muttered to my catastrophizing thoughts. It was a good thing I was in therapy. <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much, Paige. And I have questions for you too. Thank but you. I'm going to begin round two and go back to Patricia. <laughs> Patricia's favorite snack, by the way, is a Triscuit cracker. Best washed down with some, this. I don't even know how to say it correctly, Anejo tequila right mm -hmm. so if i must i will take a drink i, I think will, i must you will be amazed what it does for your inspiration oh so. yes i feel inspired <laughs> <laughs> well Wait, is, that, is that straight what well, I, I need to know what this formula is <laughs> you don't need to be any more inspired than you already are i've never been around so many inspired people and Paige, you do not need to plant these ideas in people's heads about abducting thriller writers for god's sake <laughs> I mean, seriously you guys are doing a whole lot of damage here every one of you <laughs> jeffrey daver is the worst so. <laughs> well patricia 27 k scarpetta novels later um i i want to go back to the beginning post-mortem released in 1990 is that correct yes so over three decades of k scarpetta what has this journey with this character been like for you? Um, and as she has changed and evolved through these books, how has she changed you? You know, I didn't, no one would have, I never imagined when I started all this, that when you create characters, they also create you, that it is a two way street. And <clears throat> it is, you know, my spending all these years with Scarpetta and it's even longer than you think. Cause I wrote three books that didn't get published before you know, finally postmortem did. And she was a minor character in those as I was trying to get to know this medical examiner person that that seemed to have inhabited my thoughts. Um, but I've it's it's been an amazing, it's almost like I'm writing a lifetime biography about somebody. Because um, uh, with each new book, I find out something about her past I didn't know. I'll find out about somebody she knew that I didn't know that she knew or that there's something else in her history. And, and I find it, it's it's limiting in some ways to keep doing the same thing but it's also i mean the same series but it's also a very enriching journey for me because i i like i like spending time with this character she it's you know she's a lot smarter than i am so i don't get tired of her she's probably very tired of me by now assuming she knows who i am and i don't think she probably does <laughs> well you have an amazing cast for the upcoming k scarpetta tv series with nicole kidman playing k and Jamie Lee Curtis playing her sister, Dorothy. Uh, when can we expect to see this series? I'm gonna hope fairly soon. I mean, it, you know, things got delayed because of the strikes. And now that that's over, uh, I think that they will go full steam ahead. Um, I mean, it's, I, I really, it's, 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 it's gonna happen this time. I mean, I've, there's been so many times when we thought it, maybe it was gonna happen, but this time, you know, it, it's going to an Amazon studios or, wonderful and they're very committed to it but i i'm really looking forward to the fans the readers finally getting to see these people no matter what you imagine they look like and they won't be you know everybody's got their own thoughts on that but it will be fun and it'll be different stories because even though the, the books are the genesis or the dna of them there'll be all sorts of creative things done so if you like the books there'll be something else in addition hopefully and i think it i'm really looking forward to it and i feel very lucky because it's certainly been a long time coming. Yeah, absolutely. Well, writing has paved the way for other adventures in your life as a CNN consultant or advocating for psychiatric research, funding ICUs at animal hospitals, scientific studies, excavations, founding chairs at Harvard. Can you talk for a moment about some of the places your career has taken you that you that you would not have expected? almost every place. Well, listen, uh, between the morgue and outer space and everything in between, that would be everywhere. I never expected to go to any of these places. Um, but you know what? I started out as a journalist and really that's the key to what I do. When I was a journalist, if you wanted, you know, if you, if you had to turn in a story for the night, you had to go out and find it. 
you'd go look through the police reports, you drive around and listen to the scanner going off, or, or it could be anything that struck you as a story. And so from the get go, I learned to go out and do things. And whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, I simply can't write about things that, that I don't have much knowledge about. Like if I'm gonna have Lucy fly a helicopter, then I had to go take helicopter lessons. And then I, you know, then that changed me and I became a pilot. Um, if someone, if Scarpetta is going to do an underwater body retrieval, then I've got to learn how to scuba dive. And by the way, I promise you, I really have not enjoyed that very much. Um, when I get on that anchor line going down, I was like, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. I know, you know, it's okay to breathe underwater when my body says, oh, no, it's not. So, but you do, I'm sure everybody, all these lovely people, these wonderful authors I'm looking at, we, we all do the same thing. You you explore something that fills you full of wonder, no matter what it is. Um, and that's that's what I've always done. Mm-hmm. And it changes you. The biggest thing that's changed me, though, was going to the morgue and doing research and then seeing death up close and personal. Um, you, I can't possibly be the same person today that I was back then, having seen the things that I've seen. And it's, it's given me, I hope, a sensitivity uh, towards the real thing that that I wouldn't trade for anything because I think as all of our this, these esteemed authors probably would agree um, you know you, you treat it you have to approach it with respect your stories your characters the themes um, people are reading them and you're responsible for a lot of what happens so to including people's emotional reactions so I take all that very seriously mm-hmm. one more question I, I know that you need to leave us in a moment here but um would you talk just briefly about the research process for your books and how it's changed over the years and with each successive Scarpetta novel? Well, fortunately, the thing that's changed a lot is that I don't have to run and go watch an autopsy every other minute. I mean, I've seen thousands of them and working in a morgue for six years and seen them every day and everything since then and and so on. And there's some things, as long as you know what the changes are, um, that show you're not writing about something that that technologically is not necessarily true anymore. Uh, so I keep up with all those things, but I don't have to make the rounds in labs and and um, autopsy suites like I, I did long ago. But that doesn't mean I don't keep up with it. Uh, so but but it could, you know, for example, not so long ago, I went to see the world's biggest radio telescope, which is in the mountains of West Virginia. And I want, I didn't know even what I wanted to do with it, but I just said, I've got to go look at this out in the middle of nowhere. Who would even think this is there? And I just want to see what ideas start coming to me. So that's, I I almost consider it more exploring than research because I go not with answers of something I'm looking for, but I don't even know what the questions are. But like in this new book, I saw a footprint, a big foot that a surveillance camera taken in a park in Texas. And I looked at this thing and I've been hearing about Bigfoot all my life. And I thought, is is it possible that there's something true about this? And if so, should we be afraid of this? And what is this all about? And I decided to look into it. But I always start with the same thing. Something has to fill me full of wonder. Mm -hmm. And it has to make me really curious, because if I'm not, why will you be? The answer Mm -hmm. is you won't be if I'm not. Well, thank you so much, Patricia, for joining us. It's been an honor to have you with us. It's an honor for me. It's nice to meet all of you. Uh, Some of us we have not met before, and hello. Thank you so much. And if we had had more time, I would have asked you to tell stories, helicopter flying stories. But how how about we do that another time? We'll do that another time. I I would love that. Good ones. So, all right. Thank thank you you so much, Patricia. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Jeffrey. Jeffrey's favorite snack is saltines, which I had a bunch more of these on my desk earlier and they mysteriously disappeared. And his favorite drink, uh, uh, he's got the big ones. I have the mini. It's a, this is not product placement, by the way. I'm not getting paid <laughs> from the Nabisco company at all. So I'm sorry, it, I, I, I upended you there, Tosca, go ahead. Well, I'm going on to your favorite drink, which is a Crown Royal Old Fashioned. Mm-hmm. And the recipe for this is on our site at Rogue Women Writers. So you can find the simple ingredients to make this for yourself on our site. All right. So, so you're, if I get this correct, you're mixing Añejo tequila and Canadian whiskey. Um, by our fifth guest, I have no idea what kind of shape you're going to be in. <laughs> 
I love this job. <laughs> Cheers. Mm. Not bad. Huh? All right. Not bad at all. All right, Jeffrey, would you tell us about the origin of Lincoln Rhyme? How did this character come to be and how did his name come to be? Will you tell us how you how you came, how you imagined him? Sure. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Lincoln Rhyme, my uh, protagonist, is a, a Sherlock Holmes kind of character, but modern day, of course. And he is a quadriplegic. Uh, he's a forensic detective. He was an um, uber a crime scene expert who was injured on the job uh, years ago. Well, several years before the bone collector uh, began. And you know where he came about uh, was kind of in reaction to the, well, with all respect to Bruce Willis and Tom Cruise and those action heroes, I'd seen yet again another thriller and I love them. Who doesn't? Big explosions, big bangs and so forth. But we come down to the end and, you know, let's, I'll pick on Tom Cruise here uh, who could, you know, beat the hell out of me. So I better be careful, but okay. The end of a movie and he's up against the villain, you know, often like a Jeremy Irons, the star turn uh, villain, uh, you know, the ex, you know, like Philip Seymour Hoffman, the wonderful actor who uh, has now become the uh, the villain and doing that thing for the thriller movie. And he's beating up Tom Cruise and he picks Tom Cruise up and he throws him into a, a, a big, uh, you know, a wall full of glass shelves. All these climactic scenes have glass shelves everywhere. And then they fight and they roll outside the window. And they, they roll and they fight toward the cliff. All these action movies have a cliff at the end. So glass shelves and cliffs and he's dangling over. And then suddenly Tom Cruise remembers that um, his father taught him to kickbox when he was five years old, but he repressed that memory for various soap opera reasons. Bang, the memory comes back and he, you know, kickboxes uh, Jeremy Irons off the cliff. Uh, happy day. Who doesn't enjoy those kind of things? I do too. But you know what? In the end, it's kind of junk food, isn't it? There's nothing satisfying. There's no intellectual engagement there. So I thought back to the times I read Agatha Christie or read um, um, uh, Sherlock Holmes, Conan Doyle. And those were books where the, the heroes use their uh, Poirot, they use uh, Georges Simenon, they, uh, they use their, their brains as their weapon. I thought, let's have a modern day uh, Magritte, uh, um, uh, Miss Marple, Poirot, uh, even um, uh, the uh, Sherlock Holmes's brother was even, you know, even smarter than he was. He didn't leave, uh, didn't even leave his club. So I thought I'll try it. So I made my character um, a, uh, an individual who would not be able to fist fight, who would not be able to karate kick the bad guy. And uh, so I made him a quadriplegic. I have a little personal experience with some uh, paralysis and maladies like that. And so uh, I did. Uh, the book came out. Um, I never thought it would be a huge hit, but then Denzel Washington, Angelina Jolie wanted to star in the movie. The character became very popular. This is now the 16th, uh, I guess, in the series. I mean, Lincoln Rhyme has fan clubs. There's an Albanian fan club for Lincoln Rhyme. Not me. They could care less about me. But Lincoln Rhyme is big in um, a number of countries. So, you know, and, and my job is to give my readers pleasure. That's end of story. And readers like Lincoln Rhyme. So I'm going to keep writing Lincoln Rhyme. And those of you on the edge of your seats, okay, you don't have to go buy the book. Lincoln survives the end of the watchmaker's hand. Not everybody does, but Lincoln does. Thank you for letting us know that. Um, let me ask you this question. So the first movie adapted from, from one of your books was A Maiden's Grave, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then that was followed by The Bone Collector. And uh, so just as a writer who, you know, every writer dreams of seeing their their books adapted. And what was that like? It was astonishing. And I'll, I'll tell you what, I, um, I love uh, films. I love television. I was as influenced by um, the silver screen, the big screen and the little screen when I was a boy as much as I was by books. I was a nerd when I was growing up. I had no talent for sports whatsoever, but I read, I watched TV and I went to the movies. I snuck into movie theaters. I mean, I didn't break in illegally. I mean, my parents thought I was mowing people's lawns. I would be at the movie theater uh, because I love the concept of uh, story. So when the um, um, James Garner was in A Maiden's Grave, Marley Matlin, fantastic. Denzel Washington, Angelina Jolie, uh, Ed O'Neill in the... Um, uh, the Bone Collector. I have a TV show coming out on CBS this coming um, uh, next uh, February, I think, right after the Super Bowl. If anybody watches that thing where they throw yeah, this that was my ball. next question. Is oh, it coming okay, in yeah. February? Yes, yeah, called Trackers. It's based on my uh, Culture Shaw series. Oh, wow. um, and I will 
be riveted. I'm going to be honest. I know there's some sports people. I grew up in Chicago too. Uh, and I went to um, a um, White Sox game and that was singular. Yes. Uh, only because I'm not really a sports kind of uh, uh, kind of person, but um, I will um, see the end of the uh, Super Bowl and I will watch Tracker starring Justin Hartley on CBS uh, based on Coulter Shaw. It will be a big thrill. And one thing I will say, um, I, I'm very dialogue conscious, uh, maybe because of my influence of films and um, and um, theater as well. And so one of the most exciting things is to see the script writer, I've never adapted any of my own work, to see the script writer lift my dialogue almost verbatim. And so I'm watching Denzel Washington say my words and I've seen Justin Hartley say my words. Wow. And uh, it's a big, uh, it's a big kick. It really is. Let me ask you this, similar to, to the question I asked Patricia, how has writing Lincoln Rhyme through 16 books changed over the years? How has it changed you? Yeah, um, you know, to be honest, it, it really hasn't changed me much. I look at myself um, rather objectively. I am a, um, uh, I'm a, a, a pilot. You know, I, I, I train to fly. I train to write. I sit in the cockpit, I fly point A to point B, and my job is to give my passengers slash readers uh, the best time they can possibly have. And um, I will say, so I, I don't have, I don't have an emotional relationship with Lincoln Rhyme. I have an emotional relationship with my readers. And if I, I wake up every, I've written almost 50 books. I've written a hundred short stories. I wake up every morning. This is not an exaggeration often terrified that when I sit down to the computer that day, I'm going to stumble. I'm going to make a book that's too complicated, not complicated enough. I'll make one of those twists so absurd. People say, oh, he's jump, jumping the shark. Or uh, they'll say, um, you know, there's not enough violence in this book or there's too much violence in this book. Um, and that's, um, uh, you know, that's that's persisted in the in the in everything I've written. That's a that's a constant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, lastly, I have to ask about, um, you have a very specific and unusual breed of dog, the uh, yes. Briard? It's a Briard, Briard yes. And yeah. uh, I, I was, uh, it was when we took the uh, the picture that I think you put up on the site, I have to say that was my prior book, Hunting Time, only because when I did the, I didn't have copies of my book yet. I now do. Oh, you asked to see, Tuska, did you ask to see a copy of my, my book? Here we go. Yes. Well, I would always love to see a copy oh, sorry, of your we got, book. <laughs> we, got, we got saltines in the book. Um, but, um, I, uh, that's, that's car, uh, that's blush, my, uh, champion dog. She's retired now. I, I breed and show dogs and she, uh, uh, sits at my, uh, feet along with her half brother, Monty, and they provide a great deal of, uh, emotional support and I can read to them passages and they, they basically stay asleep. So I, I don't know what that means <laughs> anyway, crap. but, but it's a, uh, you know, I think we, most of us have some kind of uh, canine or feline companion in our lives. I hope so. And yeah. they add a lot to our lives. Right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. And thank, and you. thank you for being with us tonight. Um, I'm going to move on forward, Tess. Um, Tess's, Tess's heroine, Maggie Bird's favorite drink is a Belvedere martini. Mmm. Mm -hmm. You don't have to like it. Not everybody likes them. But... <laughs> All right. And the recipe is on the website. And it's it's pretty delicious, actually. It's so, very yeah. Tess, you knew you wanted to be a storyteller from a young age. That's kind of become a theme um, with our, our writers tonight. Um, can you talk about the decision to go to medical school and then the decision later to begin writing? Well, you know, I think a lot of writers self-identify as writers very early on, maybe at age seven, which is when we start to first feel comfortable with, you know, grammar and spelling and, and writing on paper. So um, I was a big Nancy Drew fanatic when I was young. And I think a lot of female mystery writers in the United States grew up with Nancy Drew, well, of a certain age. Mm -hmm. um, so I told my father, I want to I want to write stories like Carolyn Keene, who was the, the ghostwriter for Nancy Drew. And my dad, being a very uh, traditional Chinese American father, said, that is no way to make a living. <laughs> so he told me to go into the sciences. And I ended up um, going to medical school instead. I mean, I enjoy medicine. I enjoy science. Um, but that writing thing, you know, it's, it's like always there. You can never get away from it. And so I would be 
you know, working 80 hours a week, being on call and in my in my call room where we were supposed to be sleeping, um, I would be writing a page or two. So, I mean, it just it just kept on going until I had my first child and I went on maternity leave and, you know, bless my two sons. They slept a lot. They slept like three, four hour naps. And when they were sleeping, I was sitting down writing. And that's that's how I ended ended up writing my first book um, with two sleeping kids on maternity leave. Wow. What was your uh, specialty? Test? Internal medicine. Internal medicine. So Publishers Weekly has dubbed you the medical suspense queen. How does being a physician overlap with being an author? What are some surprising similarities others might not guess? There are no similarities. <laughs> <laughs> Being a doctor is almost, it works against you being a writer. You know, Michael Palmer, the late, great Michael Palmer, who was a mister, who was a medical thriller writer, he was also a doctor. We used to teach a course every year for doctors who wanted to become novelists. Mm -hmm. So we'd have like a hundred doctors sign up. And Michael and I would always, you know, we would always like think we have to get the doctor out of them because doctors as scientists are taught to be objective, not subjective. They're taught to be a little, you know, emotionally distant in, in, so that you don't, you don't wreck your own life when you're dealing with dying patients. Um, and that's the opposite of what a writer should be. A writer should be emotionally there for their character. They should be subjective, not objective. They should be writing in the active voice rather than the passive voices, which, which is what an operative note looks like. You know, you don't say, I cut the skin, you say, and it's, decision was made on your operative note. And of course, we just had to break all these doctor um, habits <laughs> to mm -hmm. turn them into, into writers. And so mm -hmm. I, I think that in a, in a way, being a scientist or being a doctor works against you being a novelist. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to say that for lawyers. I think, I think lawyers are natural writers because that's part of their job. Mm -hmm. um, but doctors, they have to break a lot of habits. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, your novels featuring Jane Rizzoli and Mara Isles inspired the TNT series Rizzoli and Isles. So similar to what I asked Jeff, what is it like to, wa to watch these characters that you created come to life? Is there ever this protective sense of that's not how I imagined them or that's not how I imagined them saying this line? Does that ever happen? Well, you know, my big I think the big um, shock for me is Jane Rizzoli in the books is a really ordinary woman, looking woman. Her hair is messy. She's she's always she's always envious of the beautiful woman in the room. And then when they told me they had cast for the part of Jane Rizzoli, Angie Harmon, I thought, oh boy, you know, <laughs> and all of a sudden she's a Greek goddess, right? I mean, Angie Harmon really is like a goddess-like figure. So now she's beautiful. So okay, I had to adjust that. And then of course, Mara Isles is is um, in the books is sort of a goth figure, and now she's played by this beautiful sunny blonde. Um, uh, you know, uh, Sasha Alexander. So the first thing that goes out is your your physical idea of what these characters are. Um, and I understand that American television anyway um, does that. I mean, they they want they want beautiful people on the screen. Um, mm -hmm. It's not like British television where people are allowed to to get old and have bad teeth and look ordinary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you are a filmmaker yourself. Uh, you produced a feature length documentary with your son, Josh, and also a feature length horror movie together. So yeah. what is that like to work with your son? And are you working on something now? Oh, I it, it had a great time working with my son. The documentary was um, kind of, a, it, it comes out of my, um, my undergraduate degree was anthropology in, in, at Stanford. <clears throat> and I've always been interested in Egyptology and in mm. particular mummies. Um, and I've also been interested in, in food. So I was in Turkey and I wanted to get bacon and I couldn't get bacon because it's a Muslim country. And so that raised my, in my own mind, why is there a pork taboo? Why is pork a forbidden food? And so we made a whole documentary about the origins of the pork taboo and it ended up playing on, uh, on uh, PBS stations across the country. Mm. Um, and I'm not gonna tell you what the answer is, but you can go watch the movie. <laughs> In true suspense style. Well, Tess, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm, um, Guys, hang tight with us. We've got two more authors to ask questions of, and these are good ones. So um, Tracy, Tracy's favorite writing snack is strawberry Twizzlers. Feast your eyes. And her, um, her favorite drink at 5.30 a.m. is a V8. I only have the low sodium option but um, with, with lemon. 
So Splash of Lemon. Tracy, you write books set in Chicago, where you live. What's the best thing about Chicago? What do you love to feature most in your stories? Um, how does being a native shape your research and your approach to writing stories set in the Windy City? Well, I like writing about my hometown because it's so diverse. I mean, we've got 77 neighborhoods. I mean, just think about it. Um, each one of those 77 is different. Uh, each one smells different. They sound different. They have a different vibe. Different people live there. And out of that 77 neighborhoods, we all have to sort of find a way to sort of come together. And when I'm writing crime novels, I mean, there's no better place to write a crime novel than in Chicago. I mean, our last three governors have gone to jail. Um, <laughs> aldermen have gone to jail. Uh, we had one that went to jail last week. I mean, we, corruption is sort of baked into the brick here. And so when I'm looking for stories, plots, and, and cases for my fictional homicide detectives, I don't have to look very far. I mean, I go outside my door and I drive down to the mailbox and something's bound to happen. Or I'll open the newspaper and something, maybe not on the front page, but maybe on page 10 or 11, uh, a strange body has been found somewhere peculiar. And so that, that starts the brain working. And so I, it's easy to, to, to write about a, a town that I know that I can sort of figure out where to go to sort of find interesting, weird little things. And so, yeah, I, and it also, uh, it would have been, you know, a lot more uh, difficult to sort of write about somewhere else that I didn't know about. I mm -hmm. had to do a lot of research. I'm, I'm kind of lazy in terms of that. Um, so <laughs> I'm here. Uh, good things happen here. Eh, good, bad things happen here. And it's good to write about. Do you find that you portray Chicago differently from series to series or from book to book that you highlight different aspects of living well, in I Chicago? Of, yeah, I like to highlight different aspects. Um, I sort of move it around all over the city. Um, the fall, for instance, uh, takes care, uh, takes place mostly downtown in City Hall, where all of the dirty deals and the envelopes under the table. I mean, we, really, we have an interesting place here in Chicago. So that's where I sort of put this one um, around our seats of government and uh, why somebody would want to kill an alderman. Uh, we have many reasons why we probably would. Uh, but, you know, this specific killer is doing it, I guess, for a specific reason. And this homicide detective team has to figure out why. So, yeah. This is book number two in the Detective Harriet Foster series. So do you have an inkling of what's coming in the next book when you're working on the present one? Um, I sort of try to fish around for the story for the next one as I'm halfway through the one I'm writing. Um, and I'm still doing that right now. I haven't found anything yet, uh, but it'll come to me. I don't have an outline. I'm a pantser. Uh, so we sort of uh, pinball our way through our experience. Um, so I'll, I'll come up with something. I'll open the paper or I'll walk down to the park and something will happen. And my case will be there. Uh, the great thing about series is that you sort of bring your characters with you. So I have my set of homicide detectives that, and all I have to do is find them an interesting case to work on. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a hint of what will be next for Harriet Foster in the upcoming book three? Uh, the, you don't have to, but if you have anything you want to say. Yeah, I'm almost done with it. And uh, it's called tentatively titled Echo. And it sort of pings on this theme of sins of the father. Uh, the father uh, sort of doing something maybe not so great. And this killer, this killer is sort of taking his revenge out on the people who the father is associated with. So uh, it's sort of centered around college campus life. And um Harriet, again, and her homicide team are in there uh, trying to figure it all out. So that's Echo in a nutshell. Thank you for that. Lastly, you knew you wanted to write from a, a young age. So who inspired you then? And and who or what books inspire you today? Um, I, I did know that I wanted to write at a young age. And I sort of started with um, Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, like I think most people do. Um, and then you get to a point where you say, well, I think I can do this myself. I think I would like to write a story myself. And so I, that meant many years of frustration and sort of trying to figure out how to do it uh, well. Uh, and then I sort of got into this sort of wave of this great 
uh, female crime writers around the first uh, early part of the 80s, right? Sarah Paretsky and Eleanor Taylor Bland and all of those wonderful writers. And again, um, so you sort of take all of that stuff in, um, you try to sort of put your own stink on it, so to speak, and then you sort of teach yourself how to do it. And uh, for me, it took several decades uh, from start to finish uh, or to publication. Um, and But that wasn't wasted time, in, in my opinion. Um, as those rejection letters were coming in, as I was sending queries out and getting those letters back that sort of debilitated you for a second. Um, but you kept going. I kept it going, at least I did. And I kept going for decades until, you know, my shot came in. So I knew I wanted to write. I knew I had to sort of stick with it. Uh, I sort of took the advice and the, uh, the mentorship that I could find along the way. And uh, you just keep going like the Energizer Bunny until something sort of stuff comes up. So that's what happened for me. All right. Thank you so much, Tracy. And Paige. Paige's favorite snack is chips. I can't believe these have survived this long here on my desk and a diet Pepsi, which is now very watered down because I had this before. So, so bored. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a novelist, what is it like to write a series about a novelist? Um, well, it's, it's, it's fun. Uh, first of all, it's very fun. The novelist that I'm writing about has um, sold millions of copies of books, which is not the same same league I'm in, but it, it's kind of fun to imagine that juxtaposition and look at it that way. It's she writes horror novels and and things that I can't write about, but I always very much enjoy reading. So it gives me an outlet to put something into books that I've always enjoyed, but I don't think I would ever master as far as a horror novel writer. Mm -hmm. Do you share any insights of the publishing industry or experiences that you've you've had yourself along the way in the publishing I mean, industry? Just, just a little bit, just a little bit here and there. I, she talks about her experience. Uh, she writes all of her first drafts on an old royal typewriter. And I can't even imagine. I mean, I love typewriters, but I can't imagine um, putting together an entire first draft on something I can't just you know, delete whole pages and start over again um, that easily. So uh, she, her relationship with her agent and her editor sometimes mirror mirror things going on with mine, and that's fun. Will there be an Alaska Wild number six? There will. That will be next December, and I literally cannot tell you one thing about it. Not because I haven't written it; I've written it and turned in, but it's all one big spoiler alert. Um, oh. But. I I will say of the overarching um, uh, story in the series, one thing is very much resolved and uh, something else is brought aboard. Okay. Yeah, that was my next question. You know, if you could give us a little hint. Let me ask you this. You moved a lot growing up and how did this nomadic life influence your writing? I don't know. Um, I probably... My imagination is, you know, 24-7, 100% all the time. And it was only until the last few years that I realized not everybody lives that way. Not everybody is living these scenarios in their head and, you know, lived with ghosts when they were lived in New Mexico. And it was, a, to me, it was a real thing as a kid. And, and I think that these different towns and the different places, a lot of them were in the Midwest, of course, but there was New Mexico, um, there was Salt Lake City, and, and moving around a little bit gave me a perspective on opening my eyes to some other things. And I like to add those bits and pieces into all the books. Tell us about the haunted house. It was, it was a house that my parents actually, it was, we moved to this small town and my dad, of course, was a football coach. This was before the days when football coaches were paid lots and lots of money. Um, but so we didn't have that much money coming in and we had this grand house. I mean, it had a spiral staircase. It was, it was beautiful, really expansive. And we had marble in the front room. Well, this was, I was a kid. I didn't understand how crazy this was that my parents actually were in this house. Well, we had rented this house and I didn't understand why we had rented it 
until I started not being able to walk into the dining room. And I remember this very distinctly. I was probably seven years old. I could not put set foot into the dining room. And then as I was living in the house, I would feel these cold, cold bits throughout, um, like in the front room and a, a line of ants walked through one day that I was the only one who saw, um, the shower would do funny things when I was in the shower. It was very, very strange, but the most part was I couldn't walk into the dining room. Then years later, Later, my parents told me the way we could afford that house was because sadly, a young man had killed himself in the dining room. And uh, so they could not get rid of the house any other way. So they rented it out cheaply to this new football coach who had no clue, <laughs> you know, who just zoomed into town, had no clue what was going on. But um, oh, it was really startling when I heard the story. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Well, we are we we could talk for another hour um but i had a couple questions that had come up in the the chat that i just quickly wanted to pass on um in real swift mode here um we had somebody say they listened to the audiobook version of the spy coast and loved it did tess like the two narrators tess were you happy with the narrators yeah well i got to choose <laughs> you know, well there you go give me these <laughs> They give me these audio clips of who do you think would be, you know, good for Maggie Bird. And so, yes, I obviously like them. Um, do you, uh, Jeffrey, see the series Lincoln Rhyme going back into produ production? Uh, no, it won't because uh, the uh, TV series did not do particularly well. And of course, um, you know, it's a business out there. And um, I don't know what the ratings were. I mean, like seven or eight million, it was network TV, you know, which is kind of a gold standard. Seven or eight million people uh, saw it, but that doesn't mean seven or eight people loved it. So we've uh, we've moved on. I think the tracker, the uh, Coulter Shaw series is, um, uh, you know, it's got some steam now and we'll see what happens. But, you know, my I, I for me, movies and TVs, it's kind of advertising that I get paid for. My job is to sit in a, a dark room and, and tell stories, and it doesn't get any better than that. I have no desire to uh, uh, be on the set, no desire to, and maybe some of you all have, but I just, it's not a skill I have. I don't play well with others. And, you know, <laughs> I, I control my story. I'm a hundred, well, you know, with my editors and so forth, I'm, I'm, I'm like 98%. Uh, it's my creation, but no, you got to, uh, you got to listen to other people when you do a, a, a TV or a movie. And uh, what's the fun of that? <laughs> Thank you for that. Paige, we had a question. Uh, what's the tie to Alaska? What made you um, want to send your character to Alaska? I had been up there on, um, my husband and I went up there on our honeymoon in 1990. And then we went back up there a few years back um, up to Juneau. And the thing that struck me was how little it had changed. Sure, oh. it's grown, but it's still so very primitive. Everywhere in Alaska is primitive. And there's just something so striking about the feeling of being out in the middle of nowhere, even though you're really not out in the middle of nowhere. You feel that way throughout the entire state, or at least I did. And then uh, my experience in Juneau was pretty fascinating. It felt like one of the most haunted cities I had ever been to. Um, I was feeling all kinds of ghosts coming through. I think I just must be one of those people, but um, strange though that might be, but Juno was very, very um, felt a lot. I felt a lot of ghost-like activity. And so, I mean, it's just a great place to set a story. You're, when you are creating when you are creating something, I think like uh, Jeffrey said, you are the, you're making that world and you're living in that world and you, you want to create that world for what you like to do. And so I, I like that place and I like the feeling of being there. Thank you. Tracy, is Harriet Foster based on any anybody uh, that you, anybody real or anybody from your research? Um, a little bit about her is real, based on a real person. The rest of it, I sort of made up. I was sort of intrigued by the backstory of a little part of her backstory that I got from somebody else that who's a real person here in the city. And the rest of the stuff you fill in yourself. Yeah, that's what writers do. So uh, that little kernel thing that interested me, and then around that, I sort of build a character, a book person. Thank you. Um, I, one last question that somebody is asking, Deborah's asking, will there be any more Rizzoli and Isles books? Um, I don't know. The next book I'm working on is a Maggie is another Maggie Bird story about my retirees, my retired spies in Maine. I have an idea for a Rizzoli and Isles book, but you know, sometimes you just need to take a break from your characters. 
Right. Well, Chris, how are we doing? I, I imagine we have so many more questions that we could field, but time we do, we do have some questions, but we're definitely over time. So yes. um there was one question for Jeff, maybe quick answer, um, from Britton Holler. Huh. She was watching the movie Reindeer Games, and there were so many twists and turns. She thought it was crazy, and she kind of lost count. So the question <laughs> is, is it possible to have too many shocking surprises, or should the author just go for it? Hi, Britton. First of all, good to hear from you. Um, I I, uh, I do have to pull pull in when I do my first draft um, and I'm a inveterate I am an outliner I do crazy outlines and uh, so I have the outline then the first draft the second draft I have probably 20 drafts or so and I find that uh, the difference is in the outline and the first couple of drafts I have I do two things one the there are too many twists and two I kill too many people because it's a real difficult thing to kill people as we all know in the sense that um you know, the, the police are involved. And what Patricia was saying earlier is that death has to have consequences. You know, you can't just, uh, you know, I'm going to be killed by all the movie stars now, but a Steven Seagal movie, they gun down, you know, wantonly all the good guys and the bad guys. They just machine gun them down. Well, that it doesn't work that way. We need death to have an emotional import. And so um, I find that um, by the Final drafts, I get the books are leaner and uh, the twists are under control and there are fewer fatalities. <laughs> okay. And so Cindy Bauer asked everyone, so quick, short answers, because we're, we're really running out of time. But um, she wonders if you ever feel like you're living with the killers in your book. <laughs> Do they keep you up at night? <laughs> Paige? Um, you, you know, sometimes, yeah, sometimes I dream about them or they wake me up in the middle of the night, but I trudge through and I keep writing them. So, yeah, sometimes. OK, Tess. Yeah. In fact, my husband and I used to talk about <laughs> Warren Hoyt, the killer and the surgeon, as if he was sitting at the table with us. So we would look we would watch something on television and my husband would say, oh, Warren could have done that. The <laughs> uh, Warren, Warren would like that television show. So, yeah, that that was why I ended up with a series, because. Warren wouldn't leave me alone, so I wrote the second book in the series. Oh, well. <laughs> Tracy? Uh, strangely, no. Uh, once I move away from that laptop, I leave the killer there. I can just go on with my daily life. Yeah. Jeffrey? I'd agree with Tracy. I was once asked, what's it like to dwell in the darkness? And I said, uh, I don't. Five o'clock, uh, you know, it's time for a Budweiser. That's it. I, I close <laughs> the computer and uh, and move on. All right. Okay, and last question, Lisa Malice asks, um, it, it, she ran into R.L. Stein and asked him how he comes up with so many ideas because he's very prolific. And he said he, he comes up with titles and he walks his dog and then he, pl he comes up with the titles and then he plots to fit the title. So you guys all have dozens of books or, you know, how between you do you, do you generate your book ideas? Do you do you do your titles and then come up with a story? Do you do stories and then do you have a character? What what sparks your idea? In, in my case, I'm a very plot driven author. I'm not character driven at all, and I will come up with a twist or a plot, and um, then I do my outline, short outline for a short story, long outline for a novel, of course, and. Um, during the, in the early part of that process, I'll decide whether it's viable or not. I have a lot of ideas, but, you know, I, I throw out most of them. But um, I, I work from the, uh, I guess, like a sitcom, a situational uh, thriller author. That's that's what I, how I describe myself. <laughs> and I don't I don't have an outline. I don't go by plot. I listen for the character's voice mm -hmm. and I let the character talk to me. And that's how Maggie Bird came about. Mm -hmm. I'm a pantser as well. I don't have you. Know, oh, sorry, Tracy. I don't. I, I don't have an outline. I don't do an outline. Usually, it's a spark. The spark for Lost Hours was I envisioned a woman on a beach covered in blood. <laughs> I kind of do the same thing. I don't have a plot. Um, you know, outline. So I go with the dead body, put it in an interesting place, and then put, set my cops out. Thank you all. Well, thank you, everyone. Once again, thank you to Jeffrey, Tess, Tracy, Paige, and Patricia for this wonderful event and all our viewers for joining us. 
Let me remind you that each of these books is going to be available if it's not already out everywhere books are sold and they are available everywhere books are sold and we hope that you'll go pick up a copy now that you've met the authors personally. I also hope that you'll join us at our next Rogue Reads this coming January 22nd with Lisa Malice, Stephen Hunter, Dwayne Swierzynski, I think, I hope I'm saying that right, James Gripando. Um, it's going to be another epic evening. So if you choose to post about what we've done, please use hashtag Rogue Reads. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a ball. Thank you to our authors. Thank you for coming on and, and telling us about your work. And thank you, Tosca, Tosca Chris, and everyone else. Bye-bye. Absolutely. Thanks. It's our pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.